Congratulations! You've made some clamshell storage jackets for your fossils. You've mastered the basic technique. But you know fossils come in all shapes, sizes, and with unique conservation needs. So how do you build extra support into a jacket? How do you protect delicate parts from damage? And how do you flip a heavy specimen without help? We're going to address those issues, plus techniques that will help you meet whatever challenges might come your way. Once you've got your specimen set up in a sandbox, you've got to prepare it for jacketing. Voids and undercuts must be filled. You've got a bit more leeway with foam liners. They don't conform so closely to the specimen. But felt liners can be very snug. It's absolutely critical you make sure your undercuts are filled or risk the jacket locking onto the specimen. There are various ways of filling voids and undercuts. You can use scraps of foam or cardboard. A little blue painter's tape can hold the foam in place temporarily. Some voids can be filled with sandbags. You can use sheet or plank foam to create voids around large areas. But my favorite quick fill is packing peanuts. Delicate parts like teeth or processes usually don't want to take any weight. So you can pack something around them that will create a void in which they'll float in the jacket. For small parts, like individual teeth, plastilina, or Van Aken clay, does the job. Cover the bit you're floating with plastic wrap. Mold the clay around it. Then cover the clay with plastic wrap so it doesn't stain your liner as you tailor it. A quick fill for the gap around the fossil at the seam line is damp paper towel. Sometimes you'll have a specimen that's too big for your sandbox. Then you can build a scaffolding around it to support the flange. On this stegomastodon skull, I used scrap 2x4s and cardboard to build a scaffolding. I needed a chop saw to cut the 2x4s to follow my midline. I decided to leave this pygmy mammoth skull on its exhibit mount while jacketing. I boxed the skull in with vertical panels of foam core, which I cut to follow the midline of the specimen. Then I cut a bunch of squares. I used them to build the horizontal surface the flange would rest on. I added a few right triangles underneath for support and hot glued the whole thing together. Let's talk liners. When I first learned to make clamshells, I was taught to sew the darts in the liner, ideally with polyester thread. I don't like sewing much, so I looked for alternate methods. I do like hot glue, so I've tried that, but hot gluing seams was not really faster than sewing, and the seams had less flexibility. My favorite method is welding polyethylene foam with a heat gun. Just make sure you have enough ventilation. You don't want to breathe hot foam fumes. This method is incredibly fast. You figure out where a dart needs to go, cut the dart. I do this right on the specimen, so I put a barrier layer of aluminum foil between the specimen and the liner. Sandbags can help hold the liner in place. Hold the overlapping pieces close, but apart. Then, play your heat gun between them as you roll the top piece onto the bottom. And just like that, you've welded a dart. You need to be very quick or you'll melt the foam, especially with 8th inch ethafoam. Both surfaces have to be heated for them to bond. It's good to practice on scrap foam to get a feel for it. Now, if you don't want the sides of your dart to overlap, here's a trick. Cut your dart and cut out the overlap. Cut an inch wide strip of foam a bit longer than your dart. Eighth inch foam is best. Mask the specimen with foil. Hold the strip of foam right over the seam. Play the heat gun where the strip meets the seam and quickly roll the strip down over the seam. 
This takes some coordination. Here's a liner tailored with this method. This is also an example of pre-trimming the liner so you know exactly where the edges of the jacket will be. This can save you materials and excess trimming later on. When you're designing a jacket, you're always looking for the weight-bearing points where the interior of the jacket supports the specimen. Sometimes that can be tricky. One of the most difficult fossils I've jacketed was an entelodont skull. I mean, the ventral side is all pointy teeth and delicate processes. Where could the jacket make contact? The palette was the safest bet, but it was deeply arched and narrow. The jacket was not going to reach down there not without help. So what I did was carve a block of foam to conform to the palette. Here I'm demonstrating on a bone-crushing dog cast, but you get the idea. I carved the block so that it extended a little further than the tips of the teeth. That way the teeth would float in the jacket. I sanded the block to make the surface contacting the fossil a little softer. You could also cover it with Tyvek later. Then I applied a couple of dabs of hot glue and laid my liner sheet on top of it. From here I tailor the liner. In the finished product, you can see how the block keeps the canine tooth from making contact with the jacket. Just like with field jackets, sometimes you need to add external support. Wood is not archival, and metal interferes with CT scanning specimens in their jackets. The trend now is to build polyethylene foam into the jacket. The foam permits scanning, and while it has little strength on its own, wrapping fiberglass and plaster around it creates a tube, and a tube gives you more strength for less weight. You can use backer rod or cut struts from plank foam. When conforming to curves, you can slip the foam to help it bend. I rough it up a bit with a wire brush to give the plaster something to grab onto. I add these supports and feet at a middle layer of the plaster and fiberglass, then continue to cover the jacket. Feet help stabilize a jacket on the shelf, and three feet are better than four. A tripod sits better on uneven surfaces. For placement, think of a suspension bridge. Notice how the towers are about a quarter ways in from each end. That's your stability versus support sweet spot. You can make feet from chunks of foam or pads of felt. My Jacketing Sensei Chip from the Smithsonian had a simple technique. He pre-cut semicircles of foam for quick feet that fit just about any jacket. Remember, you can use a nice straight board to check the level of your feet as you design and add them, and while the plaster sets. Here are a couple of tools for sculpting support shapes. One is a carpenter's contour gauge, but my favorite is a flexible ruler. You can get these at art or office supply stores. You just bend it to the contour of the jacket, trace that curve on your foam, and cut. Whatever structures you add, make their profile as minimal as possible. This will save shelf or cabinet space. Your collections managers will thank you. Sanding dried plaster is messy and no fun. When you mix your plaster, note the time. You've got about 45 minutes until FGR 9.5 sets. After you've laid down your last layer of wet plaster, keep an eye on it and the clock. In the last minute or two before the plaster sets, you can smooth it without streaking. We're not there yet. Not yet. Now. Keep a bucket of water nearby to wet your gloved hands as you massage the plaster to an eggshell finish. Here's another trick. When you need to measure the width of your flange, your four fingers are about three inches wide. Perfect for marking out the flange. 
trimming a jacket can be a messy business. An angle grinder is fast, but generates a lot of dust. An oscillating saw or jigsaw with a fine-toothed blade makes less dust. And nippers, even less. If you want to reduce trimming to an absolute minimum, you can pre-trim the liner, then apply the fiberglass just up to the edge of the liner. If you put a fold in the fiberglass at that edge, you can reduce the need for sanding or filing even more. Over the years, people have tried different experiments, like this two-tiered stackable jacket. Sometimes, a single-sided cradle is all you need. Multi-part jackets allow you to house complex specimens in separate parts, which later can be puzzled together for study or photography. If I had reattached the broken end of this whale dentry to the section cemented to the skull, the jacket would have been an awkward shape. Instead, I housed them separately. These are probably the most challenging projects to figure out. One of the most interesting jacketing concepts is the rollable jacket. This strategy allows one or two people to flip a heavy specimen that otherwise would take many more hands or a block and tackle. The first question is, is the extra effort worth it? This is a strategy for heavy specimens that will probably live on the floor. The next question is design, where to put the rockers. I'm inclined to place them on the heavier and less fragile side of the specimen. On proboscidean skulls, that's the back end. Here the rockers work with the symmetry of the skull and that aids balance. On this pygmy mammoth, I placed the rockers on the flange to minimize force being transmitted to the specimen. This whale skull jacket is only half done. The skull is large and heavy, but not complete and not symmetrical. I decided the rockers should be different sizes, but their arcs would complement each other, as if slices from different parts of the same cone. When it rolls, it will move in an arc, like a toy top. As with any structural addition, I build the jacket halfway, say, three layers of plaster and fiberglass, and let that set. I'm using a small jacket for this demonstration. You'll have to scale it up for a big specimen. I might use a photo or sketch to rough out the rocker design. Remember, you've got to imagine how the rockers on one side of the jacket will meet the rockers on the second side in one continuous semicircle. I measure the height of the jacket to make sure the rockers will clear it. That gives me the radius of the semicircle. Double that is the diameter. I look around the lab for something round close to that diameter. You can also make a compass with a ruler or a piece of string. I might use cardboard or foam core to make a mock rocker to fine tune the shape and use as a jig. I use my jig to cut the semicircle out of some plank foam. The bigger the jacket, the thicker the foam you want to use. Remember to hold on to the jig for side two. The rockers might need some finessing at the point of contact with the jacket. If you need to, you could capture that contour with your flexible ruler. Check to make sure the rockers will stand up straight and that they're symmetrical for a smooth roll. If the contact surface of the rockers is rough or over-trimmed, add a layer of quarter-inch ethafoam or felt and hot glue it in place. If the rockers are very high, add some foam bracing to the sides for lateral support. And make sure your rockers extend at least a centimeter or half inch past the edge of the flange. This is so the flange won't hit the floor as you flip the jacket. Have we covered every possibility? I doubt it. But I hope this little overview gets your creative juices flowing and gives you a solid foundation for tackling whatever challenges might come through the lab door.